Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back on our Father's Word. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. We're going to get right into it. We ask that word of wisdom from our Father with understanding of the Holy Scripture. Don't ever, ever let anyone tell you that you're not to understand Revelation for whether you, whatever language you wish to say it in, apocalypse, revelation, it all means the uncovering the unveiling. In other words, it's supposed to be known, and you're supposed to know it. Don't ever let some man rob you by telling you you're going to be gone, you don't need to know it. I, 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 you know, I really doubt somebody that would allow a human being to tell them they didn't have to know God's Word when God wrote it especially to you. You, would, you could be taken in by anybody if that were the case. So remember, you're supposed to understand. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, let's go with it. And it reads, uh, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of Blasphema. Now, um, God doesn't deal with grotesque monsters, multi-headed. So what is he saying? He uses symbolism. It means it's a government, a multi-headed government, as all governments are. And it's called the One World Governmental System. Now, what are they standing upon? The water. And I, I want you to make a note of Revelation chapter 17, verse 15. I'm going to say it again, 1715, the waters are always the people, the nations, the people, all of them. So what have we got here? We've got Sister Babylon writing over the people, deceiving whomsoever she could, whomsoever would listen to her, whomsoever would follow the false messiah. I mean, she's riding high and handsome. You don't want to go there. The ten crowns will be worn by ten kings, but you must know and understand they're not ten earthly kings. They're ten kings that Antichrist brings with him. They are not human. They are angelic beings, fallen angels. And they will wear those crowns, and they are very deceptive. This is why that you want to stay focused on God's Word or you can be deceived. This is why Jesus would say in Mark 13, hey, when, when he would tell you the Antichrist is coming, if they tell you he's out in the desert or somewhere else, don't go. Because until the seventh trump sounds and the true Christ returns, don't be taken in. And then he makes that great statement, behold, I have foretold you all things. Have you read it? That's what's important. It's written to you. Have you read it? Verse 2. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, always changing spots. You got the Kenites there. And his feet were as the feet of a bear, an old bear nation. Got her to the north there, Esau and his, his ilk, the red nation. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion. It would, uh, you would think it was Judah talking. It's not. And the dragon, that's Satan himself, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And, and so it is that Satan, Satan does, this is, he's the prince of the air right now. This is his hour. If you let him, only if you let him. You know, it, it is disappointing to me when I hear people say, boy, Satan's really been giving me a hard time. Uh, and when Christ... In Luke chapter uh, 12, verse 10, uh, rather, rather, Luke chapter 10, verse 19, he gave you power over all your enemies, including Satan. Well, what do you put up with it for? Do you enjoy it? 
You don't have to put up with it. God gives you that power through him, his name, to drive anything like that away from you. So you, you do not have to pay any attention to the authority that the negative has even in these end times. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Now, you know, you're going to have people, every time some main leader is assassinated or dies, people are always, well, was that the deadly wound? Don't, you know, don't, but get real. What again is the multi-headed creature? It's a governmental system. One worldism. How does one worldism receive a deadly wound? By certain people rebelling and backing away from the government system and pulling their nations out of it. And that brings a deadly wound to a one world system, same money, same people, uh, all in all. It's not going to happen until Satan comes. And then he'll fix it. He will. Verse 4, what happens? And they worshiped when he did fix it. And they worship the dragon. Who's the dragon again? Well, you read his, back in chapter 12. Do you remember in verse 9 where it said, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan? He has all kinds of roles he plays. And don't ever let anyone deceive you about that. It's Satan, which gave power unto the beast. That's to say the one world system. And they worshiped the one world system, the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is like unto this wonderful one world system? Who is able to make war with him? Well, there's no nations outside of it. There's nobody there to make war against it. It's one worldism. And unfortunately, you, that some people might say, your socialism would say, well, isn't that a wonderful thing? No, it isn't. Well, well why isn't it? Because Satan heads it. That's why. And, and um, it is written long before the fact that it will take place. As a matter of fact, the formulation has already been put into the mix. And the formulation is beginning to solidify. You want to pay attention. There's many signs being shown in this generation that are fantastic. Uh, next verse, please. Verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemous. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now, any time months are given, that's moons. It's of the night, and it has to do with Satan. Okay. All, all of Christ's prophecies given to his own children are in days, because we're children of light. Never in the darkness. So we know that this is given to Satan. Well, what, what is it that he's blaspheming? Sitting in the place claiming to be God. What's the greatest blasphemy of the year is, is? Is to claim to be God to people. That's blasphemy. Unforgivable. Well, were we warned about this in other places? Of course we were. Time after time after time that he would sit in that place claiming to be God, that he would show the world that he was God. Do you remember where it's written? We've been over it so many times. I don't know how you could forget it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul talking to you about our gathering back to Jesus Christ. How is it going to happen? Not by a rapture. Not by some letter somebody has written, but by the word of God. Now, let's, uh, and many might say, well, I, how can we take Paul's word? Well, you either have to throw out Paul's word, or if you do, throw out Peter's also, because Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 uh, gives credentials to Paul that very few men ever re receive. So you, you can count on it, in other words. <clears throat> how do we gather back to the true Christ? Exactly the way it's written, a child can understand. So uh, don't ever have any difficulty with this and stay focused. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What was that subject again? 
the coming, the returning of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by our gathering together unto him. Now, what was that again? By our getting back together with the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. I want to talk to you about that. Verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind, don't get all messed up, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us. Don't let our first letter to Thessalonians, chapter 4, where the rapture doctrine comes from by most people, mess you up. As that the day of Christ is at hand, don't, don't let them tell you that. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin, there's only one man of sin, that's Satan, that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Perdition is, is um, a polia, it means to be destroyed, to perish. There's only one entity that God by name has already sentenced to death, in, Genesis, in um, Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, and that's Satan. Okay. He's a dead man walking. It hasn't happened yet, but it will at the end of the millennium. Verse 4, who, what does he do? Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Are you, you, you going to be taken in by that? Boy, if you are, I, I don't know what to say. Because children can read this and know, hey, we, we're, we're not, there, there's a false one coming, claiming to be God before Christ gets back together with us. I'm not going to be deceived, a child will say. And a child won't be, because they read the simplicity that is written in God's Word. Verse 5, remember you not, can't you tell, don't you remember that when I was with you, I told you these things, when we were gathered around the campfire, when we parked at night, we talked about this over and over. 6, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. You, well, what is that? Well, you know who the Kenites are because you belong to the church of Smyrna or Philadelphia that teaches who the Kenites are that claim to be of our brother Judah but do lie and are the synagogue of Satan as it was written back in, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 3. Verses 3 and chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. It does what? It's already working. Only he who, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The word, the, the, the verb here is transitive, meaning simply, very simple. It transfers back to who are we talking about? We're talking about Satan standing in the holy place claiming to be God. And this will only happen until he that lets, who, well, who, who controls him? You learn back in Revelation chapter 12. What did it say in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 and 8? That old dragon, I, re I repeated it just a moment ago, Satan, Michael boots him out of heaven with all of his fallen angels. Woe to you on earth. That's when he comes playing God. You don't want to be taken in by that. You are warned over and over in the word of God to not be deceived. So it is Michael that letteth, and it's Michael that executes. You, you will have some that say, well, it's talking about the church. The church has no articles. Stop adding things to God's word. Take it as it is. The subject is Satan. Say, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. What comes from Christ's mouth? That two-edged sword that cuts both ways, the truth, uh, and the truth always wins. That's why you want to honor the truth, keep that truth, and hold it, wear it. Verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, the, Satan you, gives the Antichrist his power, it's one and the same, with all power and signs and lying wonders. It's pretty deceptive. 
You, when we go back to the book of Revelation, you're going to find he can snap his fingers and lightning come down from heaven. A lot of people, that's going to shake them up. Verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Who would not want to receive the love of truth from Almighty God who gave His only begotten Son on that cross that we could have forgiveness for all of our sins? There were some that wouldn't. Verse 11, And for this cause, or because of this, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. If you want to be lied to, if you want to, if you want to be coddled by Satan, hey, God will help you out. Why? He's jealous. He doesn't like it. He wants you for a virgin bride, spiritually speaking. And he doesn't want you pulled off to the side by some other uh, lover, especially the dragon, especially the Antichrist. Verse 12 to complete. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I, I hope you never take pleasure in unrighteousness because it's short-lived. And and uh, Satan is a dead man walking. He cannot promise you life, though he will. He will promise to pay off all of your bills. He comes in prosperously and peacefully. He shows you a one world government that there can never be any more war. Only the real war is spiritual. The controversy between Almighty God and the dragon. And people will be sucked in if they're not careful. See that you don't go there. <clears throat> you know, if you have trouble with that Second Thessalonians chapter 2, let a child that's just learned how to read, read it to you and explain it to you. Because if you get rid of all the old recapping from denominationalism, it'll flow like honey over the buds of your mind. And you'll see the simplicity of the truth of Almighty God. Returning into chapter 13, the great book of Revelation, let's pick it up if we may, with um, verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. That's God's elect. And to overcome them and deliver them up. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. I mean, it's called one worldism. But there is one thing he cannot take from you, and that's your faith in Almighty God. He can cause you to be delivered up, but then that's not his plan. That's God's plan. Okay. Well, well, how could you know that? Well, it's written, Mark 13. You will be delivered up before the synagogues of Satan for in that hour of temptation. You will not premeditate what you'll say before him, but you will speak what I give you in that hour. Hour of what? Hour of temptation. For it is not you that speak, but the Holy Spirit speaking through you. What a destiny. What a time to live now while these things are transpiring right before our very eyes. What a fantastic time to live. Verse 8 to continue. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Hang on now. All whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God's elect were chosen as it is written in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 before the foundations of this world, before Satan's overthrow. Why? Well, God can trust them. That's why he chose you as one of his elect. He knows you can cut it. He knows that you trust him, that you love him, and he's going to use you. What, what an honor and what real love that our Father would love you enough. You, I, want, I don't want you to read over that verse and, and um, be caught up in the fact of the multitude for not all that many hear the truth. And that verse declares that all not chosen before the foundation, they're going to worship him. That's how good he is. I mean, he is good at deception. He is good at driving peaceful, loving, tender bargains that people will listen to. 
they're, they're all geared to see a war with, I mean, blood and terrible atomic weapons. That's not the way it will be. There will be no atomic war. There will be a spiritual war, the wickedest of all, to steal the hearts and minds of Christians around the world from all nations to mislead, to misguide. And that's why I don't want you to underestimate his authority with the unbeliever. And an unbeliever is one that doesn't realize the false one comes first. Verse 9, if any man have an ear, let him hear. Do you have ears to hear? Can you hear God's sim simple truth? Verse 10, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity, and he that killeth with the sword shall be killed with the sword. Here is the, the patience and the faith of the saints. There is so much destiny in that. Who, who are you held captive to? Well, I didn't know I was captive to anybody. You better be captive to Almighty God. That's a statement of love. And the fact that um, uh, when you live by the sword, what sword? The sword of the Lord. Do you remember back in Revelation chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, what that sword is? It's his tongue. It's the word. It's the truth. A mighty, mighty weapon. Because that truth cuts both ways. A lie cannot stand in front of it. It's going down. So be held captive by Almighty God. Do not be held captive by Satan. Many will. You're not. Because you're a lawyer, you're a loyal soldier. Almighty God. Verse 11. Now that kind of takes care of the one world political system. You want to be real careful because here comes the trickster of all. Verse 11, and I beheld another beast. This means another living creature coming up out of the earth. He was here. And he had two horns like a lamb. Looked like Jesus Christ. I mean, looked like the lamb slain. I mean, when you looked at him, you thought it was Messiah. You thought it was Christ. And he spake as a dragon because it's Satan deceiving the world. And the horns always signify power. So he's going to have a certain amount of power. But he does not, listen to me, he does not have power over God's elect. He does not have power over those that are written in the book of life before the foundations of this earth, this age. And, and he cannot and does not uh, have, have the authority to take that from you. Quite the contrary. Verse 12, and he, that, this is a religious character, okay? It's not a world government political beast. It is a religious, very religious. Some call it the false prophet. It's the Antichrist, which means in the Greek, instead of Jesus. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, that one world system, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, that one world system, whose deadly wound was healed. Oh, it is really something. There's no more war. There's peace everywhere. And, and everyone loves everyone. And they all bow to the master. There's just one big problem. The master is Satan. And if you're bowing to Satan, Christ wants nothing to do with you. You're not fit to be part of the bride of Christ. Don't be deceived. Verse 13, and he doeth great wonders, not just little stuff, great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. That is to say, I mean, they see it. Th this word in the Greek is pur, and it means lightning. Snap his fingers and bam, bolts of lightning come down. 
how do you think people that are uneducated in the Word of God are going to be prepared to handle that? And just say, oh, it is truly the Lord. There's just one problem. It's the wrong Lord. It's Christ, all right, but it's Antichrist. And he's going to, this is, uh, I want you to just take a, take a deep breath and realize he is a deceiver of deceivers. I do not want you deceived. I mean, he can put on a show big time. He can hold a revival that would make an old tent revival look like um, a goat roping. Now, that's probably not a very good thing to say, but that's how good he is. That's how impressive he is. And, and there's a lot of good old revivals that have taken place in tents around the country, I assure you but nothing compares to what this clown's going to do. Okay. And, and the reason I say that, I don't want you to take an invite. I want you to stand firm. Don't ever let doubt slip in your mind when you see these things are done in the sight of men. They are done in the sight of everyone. That's very convincing. You stay focused unless you know who he is and what he's up to. You see, it's the hour of temptation. Can he tempt you? Or do you find him to be an abomination, as you should? Because that's what he's doing to your people. You will not stand for it. Verse 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, that one world system, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, that one world system, which had the wound by a sword and did live. Oh, mighty, wonderful times. I mean, make an image of it. You, know, you might say, well, how, how does that image business work? Well, you're looking at one right now. When you're looking at a, at a television set, that's an image. And it will be all the way around the world. How wonderful it is that we can use the same high technology for teaching God's Word that He will utilize in bringing forth truth. Uh, his uh, the truth as it comes to pass, which is nothing but a lie. But how many people will be deceived? And how easy it is for people to be taken in. Truly. You know, when, when you see some people witness concerning even little governments that we have today, I mean, just really have the wool pulled over their eyes and they're snowed by it. Verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. That is to say, that delivered up before death, which is to say the Antichrist. Now, there's one thing, this, this is going to throw a lot of people because they're expecting bloodletting and all that. It's not going to happen. What role is he playing? Savior. And he will be genuinely playing that role as Savior. A Savior doesn't go around cutting people's throats. A Savior doesn't go around killing people. A Savior goes around saving people. But you see, when you read Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, Christ came to this earth. He died on the cross, gave his own life, whereby he could do what? So that he could destroy death, which is to say the devil. So they're delivered up before death himself, which is none other than the devil to bear witness. Uh, and if the word killed is fitting, because if one of God's elect refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through them at this time, it's, it's, it's unpardonable, unforgivable. And it is a spiritual death. I do not believe it will happen because I know God's elect pretty well. 
they're not going to be taken in by Satan. Verse 16, And he causeth both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in, now don't miss that, in, not on, in their right hand, or in, not on, but in their foreheads. Now, wh what is in your forehead, your brain? And the mark is simply the deception of thinking he is Christ. That is the mark of the beast. Even today, if you feel you're going to, his message is, I'm going to fly you away. And if you fall into his wagon, you've already got the mark. You didn't, it, you received it a long time before he even got here. And if you're going to take part in his one world system, you will have to go along with his lies and his government before you will receive anything from it. That's what will cause you to be delivered up, to try you, to try to save you. This is why that a mother will deliver a daughter up to death, death being Satan, because she thinks he's Jesus. My daughter is really a good old girl. Would you please just forgive her because she thinks you're a fake? And so it is, and so it goes. That's the only way a mother would betray a daughter up to Satan, thinking he was Jesus. Help my baby. But what a time we live in at a time like this. A mark in the hand is what? Doing his work, helping him out, delivering your own relatives up to him. Let me help you, Jesus. Let me, I've got an uncle out here that says you're a fake. Let's bring him in. He's a good old man. And, you know, and, and so it is that people deliver their own up to this one. That's the way it goes. But then that was our purpose coming out the gate, to be delivered up before as a witness, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through us. Do not miss the next lecture. We will go further yet into this mark. You do not want to be deceived in this generation. Don't miss it. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are. Back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you've got a question, share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination or organization. We do not judge people. We have one judge. It's our Father. He is our judge. You always want to listen to Him and let Him do the judging. You are to discern spiritually who you should fellowship with, who you should listen to, who you should study with. That's spiritual discernment, but do not judge. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And uh, we understand that the groups in China are growing like wildfire. We thank you for that. And it's good. God's Word is good to all of us around the world. Now, uh, you got a prayer request? You don't need that number. You don't need an address. Do you know why? Because God knows what you're thinking right now. You don't have to say it out loud. He loves you. He created you different than anyone else. Your DNA is different. Your fingerprints are different. You're unique because he wanted someone just like you. But he wants you to love him, and he wants to know that he can trust you 
to help your brothers and sisters in the truth being expounded whereby people can come to it rather than the lies of Satan. So with that having been said, let's go to his throne at this time and let's ask his blessings upon us through this season. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the privilege of serving you. Be with us this day. Be with all these, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with um, Sharon from South Carolina. Is it wrong for me to... <clears throat> I'm attending a church locally that teaches the rapture doctrine. They seem to be good people. Is it wrong for me to attend this church? I believe the Lord understands. Thank you for your teaching. You are so welcome. I never, never tell anyone where they should or should not go to church. Reason being, I believe what I teach. God's elect are driven by God himself. And even though a church may teach something that is not correct, if God has, it's possible God has you to go there for a reason to plant a seed sometime, who knows? I don't, but God does, and you must be real sensitive to the fact if God puts a conviction on you about going there, then that would be wrong. But if not, then um, he probably has a reason for it. But you have to pray about it and leave that to the Father, okay? Church... Uh, um, how are we going to say this? Uh, Chahoe from Maryland. My church does not teach chapter by chapter or verse by verse, and many are ignorant of the Kenites and the false Christ. My wife loves the church, and it is a, a good community. However, they are not like the churches of uh, Philadelphia and Smyrna. My belief is the truth has definitely caused strife between me and my wife. Should I continue to go to this church, I do not want to be a partaker of evil deeds because they do not teach the doctrine of Philadelphia and Smyrna. Please pray for me that the Lord guide me and keep me as I wait humbly for the true Christ return. Well, you know, you've got it right. Uh, you know, your wife is somebody you must get along with. And uh, again, God may have a purpose for you going there. But that's why I cannot tell you as I told the prior person. You must decide for yourself. Now, it begins to sound to me that maybe a little bit of a conviction is being placed on you that you want to adhere to real closely, monitor it real closely, and, um, uh, and pray about it and let Father lead you. Uh, Harvey from Oregon, when the earth is made new and we come back, we'll Will, will it be, will we be in spiritual or flesh? We're not going anywhere, okay? We're, we're staying right here. Christ is coming here, and Almighty God is coming here. We're going nowhere, and he is going to rejuvenate this earth. We will be in our spiritual bodies, whereby anything that happens to this erets terra firma will not affect us one iota and simplify in God, and simplify right back. Shirley from Oklahoma, um, and I'm glad you and your husband enjoy the program. My question is, does the names of the books of the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, have any meanings in the languages of Hebrew or Latin or Greek? Of course it does. Um, like, for example, uh, Jeremiah is whom God raised up what a prophet he raised up and sent to us. And, and like the book of Revelation, the unveiling, all, all the titles have a meaning. And that meaning usually sets forth the very meaning. Now, Genesis in the beginning, all right? And uh, sometimes the Hebrew word will title will be a little different than sometimes is given in the King James, but it's all good and they all have meanings. Carol from Pennsylvania. All souls were with God before he had us sent here to be born of woman. Were we the same as angels in the first earth age or were we 
a um, separate celestial being. No, we, we, we were ourselves, and we, we, had, we were in spiritual bodies. The truth of the matter is, our real body, the body we were created in, is a spiritual body. And the body we will go to is a spiritual body, meaning it is our true home. These flesh bodies are perishable. They get old, they get sick, and when we're through with them, we're through with them. And instantly, as it is written in, e in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, instantly, your spirit, which is the intellect of your soul, steps into that beautiful spiritual body, and you're in it from then on. Uh, Kathy from Wisconsin, what do you mean there will be no more births in the third earth age? Does this mean my children won't be, have babies? I apologize for sounding ignorant. Well, you're, you're not sounding ignorant. That's, that's a good question. Why will there be no babies born in the third earth age? Because all are changed into spiritual bodies. There are no more souls to be birthed. And when this earth age ends, it will mean that every soul has been born of woman and passed through this earth age, then it, it's over. Okay. Uh, God is always totally fair. What he does for one, it happens to all. And so it should be. Daniel from Chicago. What does the word Daniel mean in the Hebrew um, or Greek? Does it have to do with wisdom? Well, every word has to do with wisdom if you can understand it. You're wise if you can. But Daniel has nothing really to do with wisdom. God is my judge. Is what the, the Dan, Daniel, El, that God is my judge. I remember you said that if someone messes with one of God's elect, it's like putting, poking him in the eye where where in the Bible can I find this? Deuteronomy 32.10. What does it say in Deuteronomy 32.10? It's the Song of Moses. All God's elect should at least not memorize necessarily, but be familiar with the Song of Moses because that's what the overcomers sing. And, and you can read the whole thing in Deuteronomy 32. But what God says there is, I, I set my children aside and if anybody messes with them, it's like touching the pupil of my eye. The pupil of your eye is the, um, is, is, uh, the center. Um, the, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to correct myself. The scripture says the apple of my eye, and the apple is the pupil, okay, in the Hebrew tongue. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 10. Elizabeth from Canada. Someone has stolen from you, and they ask for get forgiveness from God, and they are forgiven, but I don't get my money. I want to understand where the justice is for me. Um, well, that, what you're saying is not accurate. If someone steals from someone, there must be restitution, or there is no forgiveness. If somebody stole from you and did not make restitution, only you and you only, Elizabeth, can release them from the debt. Only you. God won't release them. They owe you. And, you know, by the old law, many times you had to repay four times the value. Sometimes three, according to what the situation was. But the penalty is pretty good. So if somebody's handing you a bill of goods, if they think God forgave them and they made no restitution to you, they're sucking air, blowing smoke. Okay? Just tell them to have a good day because God's going to get them. Ruby from California. Pastor Murray, what is the true reason for God, our precious Heavenly Father, to put Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, through the torture of of a crucifixion, please explain. <clears throat> Why would Almighty God, Creator, well, have you ever read the Bible? He explains it pretty clearly. 
I've even quoted quite a bit of it uh, today from Hebrews chapter 2 when he said, you're going to tell this in verse 12 beginning, you're going to, I want you to tell this to the whole congregation. You know something? This also you will read in Psalms 22 where he was crucified. Uh, repeated there what is written in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12. And then in verse 14, it gets down to the meat of it. It said, I came, I died on the cross to bring salvation truth, but the main reason is, is to, draw, to destroy Satan, which is death, and quite frankly, all those that follow him. And, and to show that I ask you, God speaking, I ask you to be born in the flesh, that I'm not afraid to be born in the flesh myself. God with us, Emmanuel. And Hebrews chapter 2 is a fantastic chapter. It lets God, it, it, he speaks to us right down where the rubber meets the road. But you, you have to realize our Father is a God of love. And he didn't cause his son to be crucified. He was Emmanuel, God with us. He was crucified. But he did it so that he could destroy those that cried at his trial, crucify him. You see, he is the father of all the children. That father must cause some of those children to be put to death. Fini. That's not a pleasant thing. That hurts him a lot more than crucifixion does. But because they cried out to have him crucified, at least now he can say to the pit, and they are done. Fini. And he does it out of love because he does not want that elk coming back, bothering any longer his children that behave themselves. They're always giving trouble to God's elect and those that love the Father. And so he wants them destroyed, and that's, that's why he did it. They did it to him, he'll do it to them. Uh, George from Maine. Uh, question, what's too little and what's enough in our Lord's eyes? I hope I hear your explanation on television. I tape all the lectures and I try to watch them before I go to work. The word seems, sets me up to take on anything that day. Without my Heavenly Father's word, there would be no such strength. Well, I'm, I'm glad you have that strength. It, it is kind of a common thing that people think I'm not doing enough for the Lord. All he want, he, what does he want? He wants your love. All you do is tell him you love him. And our day is coming when you're going to do a lot. And that's when you're delivered up as a witness. That's, that's our purpose. That's our destiny. So you're doing just fine. But it is a common thing that people think I'm selling God short for all he's done for me. That's okay. Just pray and let him know you love him. Rosa from Georgia. Where is it in the Bible that Satan is bound by Michael? Well, you can, you can read it in, um, in Revel we just covered it, Revelation chapter 12, verses 6, 7, and 8. <clears throat> who holds Satan? Only he who lets will let till he be taken out of the way. Michael. Because Michael and his angels throw Satan, the dragon, the devil, Lucifer, morning star, the fake, and all of his cronies out of heaven. And they rejoice in heaven, but woe to those on earth, because he's down there as Antichrist, and he knows he has but a short time, five months. And uh, that's, that's when we rise to the occasion. What, that's going to be a wonderful time for us. We're going to witness many things, the presence of the Holy Spirit like never before. Benjamin from Idaho, will you please tell me what sympathidelis means? Love in Christ. Sympathy is always shortened. It's, it's, um, there's never such a thing as an ex-Marine. Once we're Marines, we're always Marines. And that's kind of our motto, and it means always faithful. You could always count on a Marine 
if he's on the front line with you and you're moving forward, he's not going to run. He's not going to take uh, the old H.A. route. I shouldn't say that, probably. Let's haul out or something like that. He's going to stay right there with you. It's always faithful. And uh, that's, that's our motto, and that's what it means. Uh, uh, thank you for asking. Rosie from Illinois. Question. I was watching television one morning, and damn the devil. No bad language I used. I felt really strong in my faith. My question is this. Was this a bad thing to do? No, you can damn the devil. That's okay. If you saw something where he was uh, trying to overtake our people, damn him. That's, that's good. He's damned anyway. Uh, Howard from California. In one lesson in Revelation chapter 6, you said the word bow was there in verse 2, a cheap imitation. I checked that out since you encouraged this uh, reference number in Strong's and it is 5115 referred to the base 5088 apparent as the s simplest fabric. How does this equate to a cheap imitation? Uh, to wh ask yourself to what? I think you missed half of the statement. The statement was this is a cheap imitation. This bow, a little cheap fabric thing, Compared to chapter 4, the bow that was around God's throne, the Shekinah glory, the light, not a fabric, the light and the presence of God, the Shekinah glory shining. And then you can understand why that cheap fabric, him on a white horse trying to look holy. He's a holy Joe, all right. He's a fake all the way, and that was a cheap, cheap imitation compared to the Shekinah glory of chapter 4, okay? But, but hey, you're doing good. Always check out when you wonder. But then remember what the reference was. It was cheap compared to the real thing in chapter 4. Jeannie from Ohio, where is the Ark of the Covenant and why are they, why are they hiding it? Also, who is they? Well, we just covered it. Revelation chapter 11, the last two verses, the, the, um, the um, very covenant itself, the Ark of the Testament, which is the Ark of the Government, it's, it's in God's house. God has it. He took it from the earth back home because he does not, man would not take care of it. Man would not honor it, the Ark which consists of the mercy seat. Many might say, well, why would God take it back? Well, what's the mercy seat? And I stop and think, well, well, that's where Christ sits. Where's Christ sitting? The right hand of God on the mercy seat. So naturally, it's in heaven. And that's what Revelation chapter 11 declares. It is my opinion considering all the ways it could have been delivered there when it was only an imitation anyway, but it was still the actual fact when God put his hand on it. Is Elijah left and he was picked up with a vehicle. Uh, who knows? We'll find out, but we do know where it's at. Christ's sitting on it. Jarvis from Arkansas in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22. Who is that referring to? Thank you. That's one of the greatest chapters in the Bible, Proverbs chapter 8. Wisdom speaks. Drop back to the verse 1 and pick it up. It's wisdom speaking. And the verse you're talking about is wisdom was saying, I was with God from the beginning. Why? Wisdom has always been with God. Do you know why? If you go all the way back then to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, True wisdom and knowledge is reverencing God, loving Him. Why? Because all wisdom comes from God. And do you know something? The more of it you share with others, the more He will give you. Your cup will just run over. So that's uh, the most beautiful chapter 
when wisdom speaks. It even tells you about God creating all of his children in the beginning. You know, how he took, how he took clay, one little autumn, and how he put it all together. Wisdom speaking. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, Marjorie from Tennessee. Marjorie, you're, you're we're doing, we're ordering the um, apocryphal. You're doing just real good, hon. Don't you feel that uh, it's good that you have material to study God's Word, okay? That's, uh, don't ever apologize for that. H Hetty from uh, Louisiana. Who is resurrected in the first resurrection and who is resurrected in the second resurrection? That's easy to answer. Those that overcome in flesh bodies and, and uh, take part in the first resurrection. Uh, as it is written in Revelation chapter 20, we'll be there in a few days, on them the second resurrection and the second death has no power. The second resurrection takes place at the end of the millennium when maybe we can drag a few out of the fire and make believers out of them. And I, I, ca I can believe that I am out of time again, all right? I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Most of all, though, God loves you for it and makes his day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. Okay, remember that. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and you listen real good. You stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, our Savior, the Messiah, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you. Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular tapes. How, was the, what, how and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you've always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series.
Welcome to the Shepherd Bible Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. A day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to finish the lecture on guilt trip. And, uh, you know, I suppose that Satan utilizes that method of making Christians feel bad more than anything else. I mean, he, example, what did Satan tempt Christ with in Matthew chapter 4? Scripture. I mean, he knows Scripture inside and out, and he, he can try to make you feel guilty and bad 